I, like almost every other auto enthusiast on the planet, absolutely love Group B rallying. It was brilliant madness where technology advanced faster than the rulebook that was supposed to govern it. And on this series, we've already covered its greatest heroes, like the Audi Quattro and the Peugeot 205 T16, as well as its incredible what-ifs, like the Lancia Delta S4, the Ford RS200, and the MG Metro 6R4. But since there were over a dozen companies competing in 1986, there were always going to be failures and disappointments. So let's talk about the worst Group B car of them all. But when I say that, I'm not referring to the Ladas or the Ferraris that never really stood a chance for various reasons. I'm talking about a car that cost far too much compared to its results, and that was made by a group that should have known better. Specifically, we have to talk about Citroen and their disastrous BX4TC. <laughs> As to why Citroen should have known better, we have to travel 30 years back in time when Citroen created one of the greatest cars of all time with the DS in 1955. The sleek, innovative executive sedan had power steering, double wishbone suspension, a fiberglass roof, and the first production disc brakes. It also had Citroen's phenomenal hydronomatic suspension, which kept the ride luxurious and comfortable over bumps. It was so good off-road that the DS was used as a camera car in wildlife documentaries. Drivers also figured out that the trick suspension of low center of gravity made it an excellent choice for rallying, and it won several endurance rallies and even the famed Monte Carlo rally in 1959 and kind of 1966. And then Citroen bankrupt in 1974 and racing didn't show up very high on the priority list. But in 1982, the Group B rules were introduced and Citroen took notice. Homologation only required 200 cars to be built, and that meant even a shoestring budget would suffice for a full factory effort in 1985. And they started experimenting with their existing Visa Group B car, and after over a year of tinkering with the Visa Evolution, a choice was made. Completely ignore the pathetic little hatchback and build a completely new rally car based on the BX. Now, the BX was their quirky-looking five-door family car launched in 1982, and Citroen decided to use it because, obviously, it would be good for marketing. Of course, by 1984, Peugeot had already made the mid-engine, four-wheel drive design the gold standard, so the front-engine, front-wheel drive layout of the BX would have to be changed. <laughs> I'm just kidding, that would cost way too much money, and Citroen wasn't having any of that. So the BX would have an engine hanging well over the front axle, even when Audi was putting their five-cylinder behind it. And the reason for this, apart from cost, was ego. Citroen had access to Peugeot's incredible turbocharged XU8 engine, but Citroen's racing manager, Goy Verrier, insisted that it had to be a Citroen engine in the car. So, they went with their Type 180 N9TE engine, used in many Citroens like the Chrysler Centura, Macho Murena, Talbot Agora, and Peugeot 505. This new engine already posed a problem, given the 2.2-liter displacement put it right up with the 3-liter displacement cap when you applied the turbocharger multiplier. More displacement also put it in a higher weight class, but in theory this shouldn't matter because the larger engine size should give it more power than the 1.8 liter Peugeots and Lanchas. Well, except for the fact that by 1985 the Peugeot made 500 horsepower, the Delta S4 conservatively made 550, and the ludicrous Quattro S1E2 ran at 600 horsepower. Citroen's rally car, not even the road car, the rally car, made 380 horsepower and 339 torque. And it weighed 2,300 pounds, which is very light. Except that that is 400 pounds heavier than the Lancia. That power-to-weight ratio is not ideal. It's also not ideal to borrow the rear axle from a Peugeot 505 or a manual gearbox from a Citroen SM. It did, however, have a carbon fiber prop shaft and fiberglass bodywork, which makes that 2,300 pound curve weight even more embarrassing. But they did have one ace up their sleeve, 
Citroen's hydropneumatic suspension. So they began testing in December of 1985. They missed that window a little bit. For the start of the 1986 season, as they had always planned, with some reserved optimism about the future. It was a catastrophe. See, Audi moved their launch tunnel engine between the driver and the front axle to mitigate some of the mid-corner understeer, and Citroen missed that memo. The Citroen also lacked center locking diffs to further compound its turning woes, and to compound that problem even more, it weighed 400 pounds more than the competition. Their fancy suspension may have been dominant in the 1950s, but by the 1980s, it was simply outclassed and horrifically restrictive and unreliable. Monte Carlo was just a month away and the car was not ready. But Citroen already delayed their program from 1985 to 1986. They had to race. Surprisingly, their driver, Jean Claudet Arnett, was running top 10 times in the early stages of the Monte Carlo rally. Not championship contenders, but better than anyone was expecting. And then he crashed. But Citroen brought another car, which also failed a suspension failure. Zero points, but it had a potential path to go down. There was some half-decent pace there. The next round was Sweden, and Arnett was flying yet again, taking the French brick to finish sixth in an impressive rebound. But his teammate retired yet again. Citroen knew they had work to do, and sat out the next three rounds to further develop the car, so they relaunched the BX4TC Evolution, which had some minor weight savings, but not enough to save them. Greece was next, and while the suspension soaked up the bumps pretty well, it still took a toll. Two out of Citroen's three entrants retired from mechanical failure, while Arnett crashed out of points. Combine the poor results, and the cancellation of Group B following Toivonen's death at Tour de Corsa, Citroen pulled out of Group B rallying after just three events to their name and just six points in total. But it wasn't all doom and gloom, because they could still sell all 200 road-going versions. This is a marketing gimmick after all. They made 200 horsepower, had four-wheel drive, had semi-lightweight materials, and vented disc brakes. That's pretty good stuff for 1986, and Citroen claimed some pretty good numbers. The curb weight of under 1,300 kilograms, 0 to 60 in 7.5 seconds, and a standing quarter mile of 14.5. They aren't superb compared to the RS200 or the Sport Quattro, but decent for the time period. If they were real. The actual weight was more like 1,380 kilograms, which meant the 0 to 60 was more like 8.7 seconds, if you were lucky. And if you were really lucky, you did a sub-16 second time on the drag strip, not 14.5. Being conservatively a whole second slower than your advertised 0 to 60 figure isn't great, especially when your car costs 250,000 francs over twice the base model. Everything I've seen over the course of this episode meant that Citroen only sold between 62 and 87 4 TC sources vary over its entire tenure. Even dropping the price by 40% didn't work. Citroen were so embarrassed at the failure that they bought back as many as they could in 1987 and crushed them. This slaughter makes the BX4 TC one of the rarest Group B cars of them all with around 30 examples surviving, less than 5 being the Evolution models. Citroen wanted the car to be completely forgotten, and it worked. Even with the Group B retro frenzy in full swing today, they only go for about 55 grand USD. Citroen wouldn't return to full-time WRC rallying until 2001, and unlike the BX4TC, their partnership with Sebastian Loeb would prove to be one of the greatest in motorsport history earning 102 rally victories, resulting in 8 Constructors titles and 9 consecutive Drivers titles. I guess you do have a second chance to make a first impression.